Yeah, I'm a music guy. I'd like to be able to put music in all my videos just to add a little bit more interest, but there are strict copyright restrictions for using someone else's music, which I, I really don't understand. When I put a, a video clip or a music clip like that in one of my videos, it's an advertisement for the band and for the record label. Again, Screaming Females, Don Giovanni Records. If you thought that sounded good, you can go buy your own. Go to iTunes, go online, you can order the record. Again, there are restrictions on how much music I can use. Uh, and like I said, I'm a music guy. I like jazz. I like alternative rock, which that was the genre we just heard. Uh, classical, country, love Chris Ledoux, Garth Brooks. Being an Oklahoma guy, you, you know, how can you not like Garth Brooks? But all sorts of music, and I'm not, uh, I'm not a snob when it comes to music. I don't discriminate from one type of music to the other. All right, having said all of that, let's talk about some common injury rate measures used in the safety profession. I refer to these as the OSHA rates because they are measures that really were created by OSHA and commonly used by OSHA. All safety professionals are gonna become very familiar with the measures that we're talking about in this video. For additional information about the 300A summary, which the 300A summary, I, I, I kind of got, kind of skipped that almost. The 300A summary is the record keeping form companies must, must keep for their injury incidents or illness incidents. All of the data needed to calculate these rates will be recorded and compiled on the 300A summary form. And if you'd like to know more about injury record keeping and reporting, I'm going to refer you to the OSHA standard 29 CFR 1904. Or you could take safety management 3403 at Northeastern State University if you're in the area. Or you could call OSHA consultation and get information from other experts if you have any questions about incident record keeping and reporting. But whatever path you take, every safety professional needs uh, some fairly detailed training on 29 CFR 1904. And that's not what you're getting from this video. Here we're just gonna focus on some calculations, specifically the calculations for the three common injury rate measures uh, that are used in the safety profession. Uh, these are the three common injury rate measures that we're gonna focus on. This is just an overview. We'll go into each of these in more detail in subsequent slides. But we have the DART rate. DART stands for days away restricted or transferred. All recordable injuries with lost work days, work restrictions, or transfers are reflected in the DART rate. Uh, we also have the total case incident rate, also referred to as the total recordable incident rate. This is the measure for all recordable injuries within a company. Again, everything that's recordable, which does include all of these DART injuries, but there are other injuries where there's not lost work days or transfers, but they're still recordable. And we'll just take a quick look at the recordability criteria from 1904, just to give you a better grounding what we mean by this. And we'll talk about those recordability criteria after I show you in more detail the total case incident rate. Then lastly, we will talk about the severity rate. Uh, which can give uh, OSHA and the employer better information about the nature of the injuries occurring and the level of severity of the injuries occurring in their workplace. Now, one thing you'll notice in these top two rates, the DART and the total case incident rate, is the constant 200,000. Uh, 200,000 represents the hours worked by 100 full-time workers working 50 weeks per year and 40 hours per week. Uh, the rate that we're calculating can be thought of in two ways. It's the rate of incidents per 200,000 hours worked, but I think a better way of thinking about these rates is the rate of incidents for every 100 full-time workers. That's to me, is the most meaningful. The rate of recordable injuries for every 100 workers within the company. Go ahead and take a look at the DART rate. If anything's ever unclear, send me a text, send me an email. Some of you have my number, give me a call. 
But let's go ahead and take a closer look at the DART rate, or the days away transferred restricted rate. Here is the formula that can be used to calculate the DART rate when you have data like we have up above here. We have uh, fictitious or data for a fictitious company. We have total recordable injuries, lost work days, lost work day cases, restricted transfer cases, other recordable cases, and the hours worked as well. Taking a closer look at the formula, LWC stands for lost work day, day cases. Now this is my acronym. I don't think other people use this acronym, but I just use it within the formula to represent the lost work day cases so that I can fit everything onto the slide in the formula. If I spelled everything out, it would take up the entire slide. But for the DART rate in the numerator, we have the lost workday cases, 75, plus the restricted transferred cases, 23. That comprises the numerator uh, in this particular formula. In the denominator, we have hours worked, 1,623,451. This number within your company will likely come from the payroll department or human resources. If you're a safety manager and you want to know the hours worked within your company or your division so you can calculate these rates, you will normally contact someone in human resources or someone in the payroll department that can help you with those numbers. But 1,623,451, we bring that down to our numerator. We have 75 plus 23 in our denominator. Let's go ahead and add those together. 75 plus 23 is 98. And I've done the math in advance, but I want to go ahead and pull the calculator up here just to make sure I didn't make a mis mistake. Okay, 75 plus 23 is 98. Yeah, that's a simple calculation. Some of you are thinking, why did he go to the trouble of using the calculator on that? I think it's a good practice to get into to always double check your math. Even if you're using a calculator, you know, do the calculations with the calculator twice. If you're doing it in your head, for sure, check it with the calculator. It's, you know, all of us can make mistakes. No matter how good we are at math, we can make mistakes. The calculator is an important tool that we're allowed to use on the certification exams. So go ahead and use it on the certification exams. But when we add 75 and, and 23 in the, in the numerator, we end up with 98. Now we need to divide that by the hours worked. We have 98 already in our calculator. So let's divide by uh, 1,623,451. We end up with 0.00006 Let's just leave that in the calculator. We're going to need that for the next iteration of this calculation. Now, I, I've rounded that long decimal number, that number with all those decimal places, to 0 .00006 on the slide. But when I do my calculation, I'm going to go ahead and leave those in the calculator. And we're going to multiply that times the constant 200,000. There's, there's that, uh, that decimal number. We're going to multiply that by 200,000, and our rate ends up being 12.07, 12.07. To interpret this, uh, we have 12, let's just round it to 12, that's a more sensible number right, when you're talking about incidents. We have 12 incidents for every 100 full-time workers. More specifically, we have 12 incidents where a worker can't perform their normal full duties. They have to miss work, they have to be transferred, or their work is restricted. Yeah, 12 out of 100 cases, and that's a high number. Yeah, this is a fictitious company, but you, you might encounter companies that have numbers like this. This is a high number that could conceivably catch the eye of OSHA. If it does catch OSHA's eye, it could be used as the basis for OSHA conducting uh, inspections of that company at that company's operations. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the total case incident rate. This is the DART rate. Have any questions, let me know. 
let's look at the total case incident rate. We have the same data that we're using. And with total case incident rate, as I've already alluded to, we're talking about all the total recordable incidents within the company. Total recordable incidents include all the lost workday cases, all the restricted and transferred cases, and all the other recordable cases. Uh, there are other criteria that can make an incident recordable beyond just lost work days or restricted uh, transferred cases. And on the next slide out, we'll take a closer look at those criteria. We can't spend a lot of time on it. That's not the focus of this video, but I do want to give you a, a refresher on the different situations or the different circumstances that can result in an incident being an OSHA recordable incident. Workplace fatalities, I'll go ahead and mention this, are recordable and would be included in the total case incident rate. And it's going to fall in if, if a company were to have any fatalities and they were using this format in their data table, the fatalities would fall under the category other recordable cases. But here's the formula that we're working with. Uh, very similar to the other formula, identical to the other formula, except the numbers in the numerator are, are different. We have the lost workday cases, we have the restricted transfer cases, and then we have the other recordables. We have the 75, 23, and the 20 that will end up adding all those together in the numerator. Hours worked is the same. Same company, same division, hours worked is the same. And then 200,000 is our constant representing 100 full-time workers. So go ahead and plug these numbers in, 75 plus 23 plus 20. Uh, Bring my calculator up and we'll add those together. And y'all may have noticed something already, but that's okay. I want to I want to add them up anyway. 75 plus 23 plus 20. 118. That is the number. When we add all these up, that's what we end up with in the numerator. What, what I referred to previously that you may have already noticed is that we already have the total recordable injuries in our data table. Uh, but I wanted to go ahead and go, go through the process. If you don't have that column in your data table, you know, we just add these three, diff, uh, three other types of injuries or incidents together to come up with our total recordable injuries. So we have 75 plus 23 plus 20. We have 118 total recordable injuries. Divide that by 1,623,451. We have 118 in our calculator already. We want to divide that by 1,623,451.00007.2685 is what we end up with when we do that division. And we had that long decibel number, just like the previous example, previous problem with the DART rate. I'm not putting all those decimal places on the slide, but I'm using all of those when I do, I'm using all of them when I do my calculations. So now we need to multiply this decimal by the constant. We end up with 14.54 recordable incidents for every 100 workers. But let me check my math just to make sure. There's our decimal. Uh, in the calculator, multiply that by 14.536, round that to 14.54. Again, what that is telling us, we're having 14.54 recordable injuries for every 100 full-time workers in our company. Also, a high rate of recordable incidents, which could get the attention of OSHA. But even if it doesn't get the attention of OSHA, the company has some work to do to try to get these numbers down. Uh, ideally, which hardly ever really occurs in real life, even though companies will say we had zero recordables, uh, that's what we want to shoot for. I, I, I sometimes question companies that are all about the goose egg and all about zero recordables. Because sometimes in those companies, when there's so much emphasis on eliminating recordables, the, the employees suffer because a company will overlook some injuries trying to keep their recordable injuries to zero or very low. At the end of the day, as safety managers, it's all about protecting the workers, 
And if a worker ends it, is injured, we need to get them the care required to treat them properly and get them back to work as soon as possible. It's not about the zeros. Zeros are great, but if you do get a worker hurt, don't manipulate the data or manipulate the case or ignore the case so you can maintain your goose egg status within your company. That's not a good thing. All right, like before, any questions, let me know. Uh, but yeah, total case incident rate, total recordables, and here are some general recording criteria. These are uh, cases that will cause an injury to be re a recordable, an OSHA recordable. Death, injury or illness resulting in the employee being unable to work. They have lost work days. Restricted work or transfer. Another type of incident that can result in an incident being OSHA recordable is when there is medical treatment beyond first aid. You take them to the clinic, the uh, medical professional prescribes medication, performs certain medical procedures. That medical treatment can make the incident recordable, even if there aren't any lost work days, even if there's no restriction or work transfer. It can still be recordable because of the medical procedures that are performed by a medical professional. But one thing I want to mention, uh, just because you take a worker to the clinic does not mean it's going to be a recordable incident. If you have a worker maybe struck in the leg with a, with a steel pipe, you want to take him to the clinic to get x-ray to make sure there aren't any broken bones. If they do the x-ray and there aren't any broken bones and there aren't any, any other medical procedures performed, then that is not a recordable injury. So don't be afraid to take your injured workers to the clinic. If you're, if you're ever in doubt about the nat nature of the injury or the severity of the injury, get them checked out by the medical professionals. And back to what I said previously, don't worry about the recordable thing. Our goal is to get the right care for our workers, not to avoid a recordable injury. Uh, OSHA has very specific guidelines when it comes to first aid and what is the difference between first aid and medical treatment. That's going to be found in the 1904 standard. Like I've said before, I encourage you to take a close look at that. And if you haven't already, at some point in your career, you'll, you'll take a, a close look at 1904 standard and um, you'll learn more about the difference between first aid and medical treatment. If a worker loses consciousness, that can also that will also result in the incident being a recordable. If the worker goes to the clinic and they are diagnosed with a significant injury or illness, even if there's not any medical treatment, even if there aren't any lost work days or work restrictions, that can still be a recordable because of that diagnosis from a medical professional of a significant injury. Example of this might be silicosis. We have a worker that's having difficulty breathing. Um, he goes to our clinic. He's taken by our staff to a clinic. The medical professionals perform tests. They do their examinations. They diagnose the worker with silicosis. Now they may not provide any treatment. They may not restrict the worker from working. They may not keep the worker from working. But even though there's no lost work days, even though there's not any restriction or transfer, it could still, it's still going to be a recordable because of that significant illness diagnosis that occurred. All right, like I've said many times, more information in 29 CFR 1904. We're really just focusing on the calculations in this video. Take a look at CFR 1904. The last common rate measure that I want to take a look at is the severity rate. Uh, it's a measure of incident severity. It's the number of lost work days associated with each recordable injury for a company. We can think of it as the average lost work days for each recordable incident. It's a, it can be used as a good measure for discerning the nature of a worker injury within within a company or between companies. For example, a company with a lot of recordable lacerations may not have a lot of lost work days and a low severity rate. 
compare that to a company with recordable back injuries. Back injuries oftentimes uh, are accompanied by lost work days or restricted uh, work days. That company is going to have more lost or restricted work days and a higher severity rate. Uh, so this is, for me, this is a primary use for this particular measure to discern the nature of the work injury and the level of severity relatively speaking within our workplace. Simple formula, it's just the lost work days divided by the number of recordable injuries, total recordable injuries. Plug those numbers into our formula, we have our lost work days, 1,754 divided by our total recordable injuries, 118. Let's do our calculation here. Seventeen fifty-four divided by one one eight. Fourteen point eight six four. Uh, round that to fourteen point eight six, and for practical purposes, let's just call it fifteen. This company has an average of fifteen lost work days for each recordable injury. Also high, uh, comparatively speaking. That's a that's a high severity rate, which may also get the the attention of OSHA. All right, we've talked about the three, the three most common uh, rate measures used in the safety profession. It all goes back to OSHA, the OSHA 300, and the types of data that employers are required to, to maintain uh, for their operations. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, email, text, call if you have my number.